Welcome to the Outreachy Colonel Internship Report. We are recording this today. This is April 3rd. We're recording this ahead of the OSS Summit in Vancouver next month. The last time we were at OSS Summit was in fall of 2021, when we also recorded for the Seattle Summit. Today I have with me interns from the last two years. I have Deepak Varma, Jehi Park, Carolina Stolarek, Rebecca McKeeva, and Sabin Jagayeva. We also this time have mentors with us. Um, David Hildebrand, Ira Winey, Mike Rapoport, Rupa Prabhu, and Stefano Brivio. So we've brought our own virtual audience with us today who will be able to ask questions and make comments on the intern presentations. And maybe at the end, we'll have time for them to offer some of their reflections on being a mentor for Outreachy. I'll give a, a brief overview of the Outreachy program, and then we'll, we'll go right into the interns presenting their work. So the Outreachy program, you can read all about it at Outreachy.org. It is a program across all open source, and the Linux kernel is one of the communities that participates in it. They open the program to anyone facing underrepresentation in the technology industry of their country. And applicants apply. Um, interns who are accepted do get a, are paid a stipend. The entire program is remote. And we do this twice a year. Okay, we have five interns presenting, and we're going to start out with Deepak presenting on his Cochinelle project. All right, well, thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Deepak Parma. I've been part of the, uh, the outreachy. Um, December 2022 cohort as an intern and worked on the Linux uh, project, Coxinella cleanups in the Linux kernel. And as part of this project, my mentors were uh, Saurabh Sengar and Praveen Kumar. Uh, so talking quickly about the Coxinel software itself, it's a program matching and transformation engine. Uh, you can get the details at this particular location. The slides will be made available to you, so you can you can go click and read more about Coxinel uh, at this particular URL. Uh, it's a software that's pretty well integrated with the Linux kernel code base. Uh, it primarily uh, is used for uh, resolving collateral evalu evaluations, uh, smart identification of code patterns. Uh, bug identification and it can also be extended to fix some of the uh, some of the bugs as well. I mean, there is there are Linux patches that can be automated automatically generated using this particular software and they can be validated and applied to the code for automatic resolution of the bugs. Uh, it's basically based on semantic patch scripts. Uh, these are external script files uh, written in simple uh, you know, text editor and then can be clubbed integrated with the coccinel software to scan through the code and find the uh, different areas of the code that needs attention. Uh, these patches can be added, they can be edited just like any other Linux kernel patch. So it's, it's that uh, closely integrated with the Linux kernel code base. Uh, these patches can be, can be improved and uh, they can be submitted uh, just like any other Linux patch uh, to be part of the Linux code base. Um, the core development team for Coxinella software is comprised of, I worked with uh, Julia Laval, Thierry Martinez, uh, Nicholas Palix as part of my project, but there are many other contributors who regularly contribute and uh, keep evolving this particular software. Uh, you know, it's it's open uh, open source software, so lot lot many contributors are there. Uh, at the moment, there are uh, seventy two semantic patches that are part of the Linux kernel code base, and I have extensively worked with a lot of these. I, almost all of these as part of my uh, outreach project. Uh, moving on, 
talking quickly about my uh, outreach project. Uh, the objective of this project was to improve the Linux kernel code base uh, with the help of Coxinail software. That was the primary objective uh, as far as the project itself is concerned. And also I was required to write blogs on utilizing these semantic patches so that in future, if uh, uh, if this no, if, if uh, working with the semantic patches needs to be understood well by any new interns or any, um, any anybody, they can refer to these blogs. So these were the two defined objectives uh, for my project. And in terms of my own benefits, um, I, wa I was expected to be uh, learning how to work with the Linux community, uh, understand the Linux code organization, understand the development process uh, that is being followed as part of uh, the Linux kernel development, and also understand the Coxinel software and how it can be applied to the Linux code base. So these were uh, the benefits that I was targeting as part of the uh, OTG internship. So uh, yeah, the, my internship started on 5th of December, 2022, and it ended on 3rd of March, 2023. It was a pretty exhaustive 12 week long internship. And during this internship, I, uh, I submitted 115 patches. Again, it's not a number game. I think uh, quality always uh, weighs more in Linux kernel than the quantity, but just to summarize in terms of uh, uh, in, 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 to describe the success of the project, uh, the total patches that were submitted was 150. That around 30 patches that are still uh, uh, either in discussion or uh, that that need the maintainers to approve those. Uh, the 54 patches that have been accepted or applied uh, by different kernel team maintainers, and around 32 patches were declined. Uh, some of these patches were already submitted a few days uh, before I could turn them in and some patches were, uh, were, were not find to be so useful or so impactful to the maintainers and they decided not to accept those patches. So those form the, uh, the part of this 32 that were declined. Uh, the other outcome of the project was uh, the blogs. Uh, I, uh, I created a, a website where I have published 14 different blogs and these are primarily the uh, semantic patches that I was able to work with. There are a lot of semantic patches that did not report any issues. So I, I could not uh, submit any patches for a lot of uh, the semantic patches, but yes, so for those where I could find uh, potential opportunities for improving the Linux kernel, I have added blocks for those. There's still a few that uh, needs to be added, but yes, right now the count stands at 14 blogs. Uh, I also was able to make some minor contributions to the kernel newbies uh, wiki space as part of the internship. Uh, one of the tasks was to find such opportunities and, and keep improving the overall uh, newbie uh, wiki space and also found opportunities where the coccinel scripts themselves uh, could be improved. So I submitted three patches which were aimed at improving the coccinel script itself uh, for the betterment of it. Yeah, so at the end, uh, what I achieved personally, I feel I have really uh, understood the Linux code base very well. I have been able to successfully build and compile different drivers. Uh, this project was pretty horizontal. Uh, it, it was not aimed at one particular subsystem. The application was across the entire Linux code base. So I ended up uh, compiling or building drivers for different architectures, different uh, uh, you know, different subsystems and that really gave me a good understanding of the, the kernel code organization. Um, I also learned how to use co coccinal semantic patches for uh, the Linux code itself, uh, writing and editing semantic patches. And this is an ongoing learning, uh, though it is a, a simple ASCII based uh, code that uh, for semantic patches. Uh, it's, you need to learn it. It's not very straightforward. So I continue to learn more about how to write semantic patches. But yeah, I mean, in my experience, once you write good semantic patches, they are very useful. And as, as you practice more, you really become efficient at it. So I'm expected to continue my learning on, on this. Uh, I also understood how to work with Linux kernel, how to submit patches. Uh, I learned how to interact with the amazing Linux community. Very, um, very good and useful experience. And understanding the open source culture and communities overall, uh, this was one of the biggest learning. Um, I, I was new to open source, so the, the, this participation really made things very clear to me. 
and also learn from the other mentors and the co the uh, the outreach uh, support group about how i can utilize my experience and and explore opportunities create network where i can uh, I, you know i can utilize and and uh, uh, try to uh, get the paid job opportunities as well uh yeah and the path forward uh, i'm now looking for uh, identifying a subsystem or a driver module where i would like to build some expertise uh, as part of the current outreach cohort i uh, i have been uh, nominated as one of the mentors uh, so i'll be working on one subsystem and hopefully that is something where i will continue to build more expertise going forward uh, secure necessary hardware and develop some testing skills this is one aspect that i could not achieve completely in three in, in those three months so there are opportunities where i think i can uh, develop some testing skills as well uh, i'll continue to contribute patches uh, using the cox nla scripts and also continue to learn about writing semantic patches i wish to get closer to the community and as part of that uh, participating in the conferences and meeting the community uh, members uh, that, that's something which i wish to continue to do and uh, yeah, I also want to explore and, and impact more in terms of the local community here in my uh, my, my town, my area, and uh, try to build a, a relationship with the Linux enthusiast. Try to develop more interest with uh, students who are willing, uh, who are who wish to work on open source or in, in the Linux kernel community. So I also intend to uh, in, increase some participation in those areas. And as I mentioned, there are some blogs that I still need to write and complete. And also I'm looking for paid opportunities uh, where I can build upon the experience that I've learned as part of my uh, uh, outreach internship. And finally, about Outreachy, about my experience working with the Outreachy team, uh, this has been the best team that I've ever worked with. I have some past experience working with different private companies. I've worked with different teams, but I think my personal experience working with the whole outreach group has been fabulous I, I this was the best team i ever worked with uh, the the entire team is very understanding they, they support you very well and they continuously in, encourage you uh, through different challenges or obstacles that you might encounter so uh, they always drive you um, and professionally managed hassle-free payment so this was one of the uh, questions that i had initially how i will get paid etc but I really don't have to work, uh, don't have to uh, worry at all about the payments or about how things will move. Everything was just moved as planned from day one. Uh, and, and they are very driving for success. Um, some, sometimes they, they realize somebody is slowing down and they kind of try to get in touch with that person. They really understand what are the problems, how they can help. So they're really driving um, interns to be successful in whatever project they are part of uh, it's a full uh, you know open source uh, mindset and community culture uh, within the team and they use modern tools and techniques i have seen a lot of interactions using chats and uh, you know a lot of modern tools are being used to monitor and track uh, the the application status how, how the interns are doing etc so a lot, a lot of good things uh, or tools are being used by the team and they continue to promote skill development and they also keep tracking uh, your progress throughout the internship program so they, they are really very good uh, at ensuring that the internships are successful uh, the interns are able to achieve their goals and um, yeah they, they really do a very good hand holding so i really find myself to be very very uh, blessed to be part of the outreach uh, December cohort, and now I'm really looking forward to be playing that mentorship role in the upcoming uh, outreach cohort. So with that, I would like to thank and would like to know if you have any questions or uh, anything that I can I, I can answer. Thanks, Deepak. That was great. I I I, I guess. I wanted to point out that your program, one of the particular challenges of what your project was that you had to work across all subsystems. Um, there's two kinds of projects, and I think you know, Ira's familiar with another one that had to work across many subsystems. 
And sometimes right. folks focus on one and they come with two different sets of challenges. Um, and you shared your patch acceptance rate. And that's a really great rate just for, you know, people watching. And that, that's a, um, you did a wonderful job with that. All right. Hi, I'm Jayhee. I worked on adding a new subnet filter, um, filtering feature in the kernel networking stack. And uh, I had a great time working with my mentors, Ruka, Stefano, and Andy. So I wanted to point out three areas I found really valuable in developing um, within the Linux kernel. So the first is I worked mainly in the networking uh, area. So I learned a lot about the internals of the networking stack. And I also learned a lot about debugging tools and building uh, a workflow that's very efficient, like building a minimal image and testing tests very quickly. And I also learned to make a lot of great tests and um, had a wonderful opportunity to use a library for um, creating the self-tests. So, and in this talk, I will focus on two topics noted by the arrows. Um, I'll, I'll talk first about the a small feature I added to the networking stack, and then I'll talk about um, creating self-tests using the library. So I wanted to talk about some basic networking concepts before moving on to um, the project. Um, so ARP is a communication protocol. Um, and here in the yellow, you can see uh, the Wireshark um, data that I took of the communication between my router and my computer. So it kind of goes like my computer would say, who has IP address 192.168.01? Um, and then my router would say, yeah, that's me. And this is my MAC address. Who, who are you? Tell me your MAC address. And then my computer would say, yep, this is my IP address uh, 0.31. And this is my MAC address. So between the router and the device, it's using the ARP protocol to kind of relay the IP address and the MAC information. And GARP uh, or gratuitous ARP is when a device announces itself without being prompted by an ARP request. So Usually you're responding to a request, but in this case, you would just announce uh, announce yourself without being prompted. Um, and by default, the devices are configured to drop all of these gratuitous ARP frames, but you can enable the device to accept GARP with um, the ARP accept system control. System control. Um, and another thing to note, uh, is, sorry, I forgot to turn on my computer. Uh, another thing to note is um, there's IPv4 and IPv6. So in IPv4, um, it's called ARP, but in IPv6, there's its um, end disk or neighbor discovery. And the GARP that I mentioned was is um, unsolicited neighbor advertisement in IPv6. And this is control for, um, for uh, enabling the different behaviors is ARP accept in IPv4 and in IPv6 are drop unsolicited NA or accept unstract NA. So the goal was to provide a subnet filtering option for GARP during neighbor discovery for both IPv4 and IPv6. And the patches were sent to the netnext tree of the Linux kernel, which is where all the networking development happens. Um, so this is how um, uh, it was implemented. A new option was added to the ARP accept uh, sys control. Um, so in case two um, is where I added the new feature. So previously it was binary. It was accept uh, gratuitous ARP or don't accept. But uh, now I've added a third case, um, case two, where it would accept ARP or gratuitous ARP if it's in the same subnet as you. And this same feature was implemented in IPv6. So next, I'm going to be talking about uh, creating tests to validate the new feature that I've implemented. Um, and creating tests is actually one of the first things I did starting the project to learn more about network topologies. So in, in my case, it was pretty simple. I'm setting up two namespaces, and uh, each has um, a interface. And then I'm creating a VE pair between the two interfaces. Then I use ARPing to test. Um, so I had a great opportunity to use the library, a library that Stefano made with the help of other interns. 
And for just the setup test, this is just the setup um, process. Uh, you can see that on the left, it's much longer using the without using the library, but on the right, with using the library, it's a lot cleaner and a lot shorter. So the library kind of extracts a lot, a lot of the common code from the test and um, eliminates re repetitive uh, code when setting up the network topologies. So I'll delve into more detail of the code on the right. So for setting up namespaces A and B, it's as simple as calling NSAB and then creating a VEth pair between them is simple as VEth A and B. So this is it. This is um, all you need to do to set up. And um, then you can also use uh, functions like address get to get the IP address given the device interface. So um, yeah, that was a great experience uh, learning to use the library, creating a lot of tests, and uh, implementing a feature within the Linux kernel. Uh, I learned a ton. Uh, my mentors helped discuss various ideas and improve on multiple iterations of the patch sets. Um, and previously, I was uh, before I was really scared of the Linux kernel community, and working with my mentors gave me the confidence in interacting with the community. And I thought that the connections made in the open source community and with the mentors was especially uh, incredibly valuable. So thank you. Um, yeah, you can check out my blog and my Twitter here. Thanks, Awaiji. Hello, everyone. My name is Karna Stolarek. I'm a software engineer on i915 driver team. That means that I'm mostly working on graphics drivers nowadays, but today I would like to talk about something different. That is my outreach project, which was to build a memblock simulator. But before I start talking about the project itself, I think that would be good to explain what memblock is and what do we mean by simulator in this context. So memblock is a boot time memory allocator. It is a special mechanism that is used before the usual memory allocators are initialized, which is very early boot. And it has a broad variety of APIs where you can register or remove memory regions and also allocate physical and virtual memory. As for the simulator, it is just a user space program that runs the kernel memblock code. Uh, and it can be run in, in user space thanks to mock definitions that I had to provide as a part of my project. And in addition to this, I, I wrote a series of unit tests that exercise basic features of the allocator as well as uh, uh, allocator functions. So the name of the project was to create memblock simulator and I had three main goals which was to write a blog post about memblock to learn um, its functionalities, how it works and what should be tested. And I had to provide a skeleton of the simulator, which uh, was thought to live in tools testing infrastructure uh, with the requirements of reusing the actual memblock code, identifying what kind of definitions I have to provide in order to even compile this code and provide uh, a couple of test scenarios that verify that memblock does what we what it's asked to, to do. And as a stretch goal, uh, I was to experiment with different memory layouts in QMO. Overall, I was able to do the first two. So here you can see my blog post about memblock and I implemented a memblock simulator and provided most of the definitions that were required. But unfortunately, I didn't have time to experiment with different memory layouts. So the main highlight here is that I was able to ship an initial version of the memblock uh, test suit. I provided a lot of the stuff definitions that could be reused in other tools and projects. Uh, I implemented tests for basic API uh, as well. Thanks to the addition of uh, simulated physical memory, I was able to test allocation functions that return virtual addresses. But it wasn't a smooth ride especially because I was greeted with hundreds of compilation errors and I had to walk through each of them one by one to see what kind of definitions I have to provide in order to even compile memblock code. Uh, but it went surprisingly well. Uh, I was able to get this done in a week and a half, I believe, so it wasn't that scary at all. 
And the, the second one may seem obvious right now, but it wasn't to me back then. So the allocation functions require valid memory addresses. And before that, I just picked just arbitrary addresses, which wasn't great. We, we wrote this later on, and there was a simple solution to that. I just had to malocate a chunk of memory and ask memblock uh, to work on it. So yeah, it will take a long, long time to get into ins and outs of the project. So here I'm linking a couple of resources if you want to learn more. First of them being the official documentation. The second one being the blog post that I wrote as a part of my outreach internship. And two of them are linking to the patch series that I sent uh, as a part of my project uh, with the first one introducing the basic tests and the other one um, the test for allocation functions. So, so yes, yeah, so that's all. Uh, if you want to just you know, ask me a question, don't be shy, reach out to me. Here's my email and Mastodon handle. And thank you very much. Thanks, Carolina. And if you notice Carolina's email address there, I was really happy to hear that um, when our outreachy um, connection ended, she joined me and is now working at Intel. As she said, you're working on graphics drivers now. Yeah, yeah, in DRM, and that's that's is great. <laughs> so yeah, I'm not doing so much in memory in memory management, but yeah, still great work. I'm I I can you know I'm working in open source mainly you know upstream patches, and usually I'm writing tests for uh, for the graphics drivers, but also I send some comments to the DRM subsystem. It just takes some time to get you know into this, so. Well, it's wonderful that you stayed in the community. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. OK, well, next we have Rebecca McKeever, and this was this is special, but not uncommon that we'll have a project and it will come back for a second round, as did Memblock Simulator. So let's hear from Rebecca. Well, I worked on extending Memblock Simulator that was introduced by Carolina. And I made many extensions and improvements to the simulator, including API improvements, test improvements, new tests, and introducing NUMA support for NUMA layer memory layouts. So the first thing I did was added verose testing output so you could see which memblock test was being tested and also the name of the test and whether it passed. And I added labels to like top down and bottom up to for the um, verbose output for alloc tests. Verbose was initially a build option, but then I changed it to runtime option. And I also changed Moval node to runtime option and introduced a help menu. And I also added a build option to enable debugging messages and to enable NUMA support. And I improved some of the memblock alloc functions uh, that are expected to clear a memory region. Previously, the test either didn't check or they checked the first byte. Now they pre-fill the entire region with non-zero data before the test and then check the entire region after the test. And I introduced new tests for several functions that were already being tested and I introduced test coverage for several of the alloc functions as well as set bottom up, bottom up and trim memory. 
for the NumBlock alloc raw functions. They don't clear the memory region, but they're otherwise the same as the corresponding functions. So instead of creating a separate test, I created flags so that you could test the raw versions with the same set of tests as the regular versions. And I had the raw versions check that the entire region was still non-zero. And to add new support, I set up a memory layout with multiple NUMA nodes. In a previously allocated dummy physical memory. And I used eight nodes of varying size between one sixteenth and one fourth of the total allocated memory with an IDs from zero to seven. And then I added tests for Memlock alloc try NID, Memlock alloc try NID raw, and Memlock alloc exact NID raw, where the NID was set to from uh, zero to seven. One of the challenges that I was not able to complete was adding tests trying to add or reserve the 129th region to trigger memlock double array. I was able to write tests that succeeded at the task, but then they caused other tests to fail. And they were not restoring the memory regions properly. So, Outreach has been a great opportunity for me, and I'm grateful for feedback and support I received from mentors in the open source community. And I feel more confident contributing to open source projects. And you can read more about my outreachy work on the blog that's linked here. And Rebecca, you're at um, Collabora now? Yes. Yes, so the Collabora is another um, frequent sponsor overall of, of the Outreachy program, meaning that they donate funds to the Outreachy program. So I'm Savine. Uh, I was Outreachy intern last year. Uh, my mentors were Andy, Rupa, and Stefano. Uh, I started my outreach journey by sending uh, small cleanup patches uh, during the contribution period. So these were uh, small changes, uh, but they will improve the re readability of the Linux uh, kernel driver code in the staging area. Uh, then I saw uh, Stefano's call on improving um, the Embuto script, uh, which stands for uh minimal builder using terse options um so embuto is an image builder for lightweight virtual machine environments and uh, one specific area that stefano wanted to improve uh, was uh, running the kernel self-tests uh, I spent a week or so to understand Stefano's script and uh, was what was doing and uh, what needs to be done. And this followed uh, by lengthy chats with him and countless email exchanges with Stefano, uh, which significantly helped me to improve my understanding of uh, shell programming. So then I spent uh, the remaining time of the contribution period by adding uh, a feature to Embuto that streamlined kernel development. So uh, to understand the feature, uh, let's first consider the typical workflow of a kernel. 
development inside the virtual machine. Uh, so the bugs uh, do not affect his own machine. So to Excuse this me, end, uh, Savant, I wanted to sure. interrupt. I'm not, I'm not seeing the slides progress. Um, and I looked at your slides. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm here Thanks. right now. Okay. Um, so um, a kernel developer makes the code changes uh, to the kernel inside the virtual machine. Uh, then at uh, self test um, or compiles and boots the modified kernel in the virtual machine, uh, runs the self test and ensures that uh, they all pass. And this cycle is uh, continuous. Uh, last two steps are very tedious and uh, take a lot of time. Uh, I think somebody is uh, unmuted. Um, so um, last two steps are tedious and take a lot of time. And uh, that's where Embuto helps. Uh, so here um, Embuto uh, comes and uh, Embuto helps uh, the developer to lighten this light last two uh, steps. Um, so with Mbuto, the kernel developer can develop the code and add tests outside of the VM, working on their own machine. After the changes are done, uh, the developer can compile the kernel on the main host and run Mbuto using uh, the the command that I uh, provided here. So as you, you can see, uh, the output of Mbuto command is passed as an init rd argument to KVM. Uh, and Mbuto creates uh, an init rd image that contains all the tests from the compiled code on the main machine and runs the net tests when booted. Uh, which is sp specified by uh, dash C. Um, uh, so uh, when a parameter, um, when a developer runs uh, this, uh, um, this KVM dash kernel um, command, um, KVM runs a virtual machine and boots the image uh, that Mbuto created and and then uh, runs the self-test, which is much faster uh, doing it manually. Uh, so what I did um, was uh, my contribution uh, was uh, to uh, my contribution was like to optimize uh, Embuto to build images faster. Uh, by default, uh, Embuto was putting all the modules and all the tests uh, into the image, which was taking around five minutes on my machine. Uh, but uh, I improved Embuto so uh, that when a user specifies a test collection, such as dash net, uh, Embuto automatically finds the modules required to run only these tests and creates a much smaller image. Uh, with my uh, contribution, Mbuto created an image in just uh, 50 seconds on my machine. So after wrapping up with Mbuto, I checked other projects and uh, that I wanted to work. Uh, so I was particularly inter interested in um, something that related uh, C programming language. So I chose to fix a bug in VLAN bridge binding module without knowing what bridge binding is. Uh, so I spent lengthy time to read uh, all the concepts like um, VLANs, uh, bridging and other necessary networking concepts and did a code, code walkthrough with uh, Andy. And Andy helped me to understand important parts of VLAN and bridging modules. Once I understood the networking concepts and how they mapped uh, to the code structure, 
uh, I try to find the cause of the bug. Uh, during our regular meetings, uh, I learned from Rupa about the perf tool and uh, how we could insert dynamic uh, trace points to the back uh, kernel code. Uh, Rupa provided me with initial examples uh, of how to use perf probes and explained how they work. Um, so um, after uh, working on the VLAN bridge binding modules, I understand that uh, it's really hard to find the bugs, uh, but uh, my mentors helped me a lot. Uh, and uh, after finding a bug and uh, finding solution, uh, the very first step was to get my mentor's approval. Uh, then I sent the patches, uh, um, but of course there were issues and maintainers disagreed uh, in certain uh, parts. Um, and uh, I spent last uh, a few weeks by sending and receiving the uh, email exchanges with the mentors and also maintainers. Um, yeah, this was uh, overall my experience. And right now uh, I am uh, I'm about to wrap up my uh, degree and uh, this outreach internship uh, gave me uh, enough uh, courage that I, I'm now applying uh, Linux kernel developer uh, positions and I heard ba uh, back from Canonical and I have uh, ongoing uh, application process with them and uh, wish me luck on that. And I want to thank you all my mentors and everybody else that made this uh, uh, possible, especially Outreachy. Thank you. Thank you, Savinj. And yet you need to keep us informed about Canonical. That sounds wonderful. Sure, sure I will. Any final thoughts? I, I was wondering for all the, all the interns, what, what was one of the most intimidating things that you faced while you were going through the program? And, you know, a, a couple of you mentioned that you were you were were braver or you were a little hesitant or scared to to work with the Linux community. So, you know, does anybody have any like, wow, this was really hard or this maintainer was pretty, uh, you know, difficult to work with, but but you got through it like experiences to share? Yeah, in, and this is Deepak. So in my experience, I think what I realized working with various subsystems, uh, uh, th there is no compromise in terms of quality. Uh, everything that you submit has to be top notch and it has to meet the highest standards of uh, quality, highest standards of performance. There is no, there, there is no um, acceptance to, to, to any, uh, even a minor miss in your submission. So the, the, the perfection is definitely uh, need, necessary in whatever you are doing. And that's where uh, sometimes you have to, you receive a lot of rejection or sometimes you receive a lot of feedback. But at the end of the, you know, uh, end of the process, when you see your patch accepted and you look uh, the difference where you started and what you ended up submitting, you can clearly see, um, you know, the best coming out of you. So I think it has been um, my experience that you need some time to really understand why sometimes the feedback is hard. But at the end of it, when you see what you have been able to achieve because of that hard or that uh, uh, that feedback, you really feel great about realizing a new dimension about yourself. So I, I really feel uh, initially it was not that easy to work through, uh, you know, so, so much of the feedback. But yeah, once you start understanding you get used to it and eventually nowadays if you don't receive feedback i feel like somebody is not looking at my patches so you now get used to uh, you know knowing more from your mentors knowing more from experts and and you really feel like they should comment on your code it becomes a habit so yeah eventually you get there
Thanks. Uh, have, not sure have, I answered your uh, uh, your question there. No, no, that was that was a great response. I'll, I'll let David. Sound, it looks like David wants to say something. Right. So um, looking back, we, we had a lot of projects in the kernel that are more focused on, let's say, simulator, testing, self-test, these kind of things. Uh, of course, like whenever we're dealing with such projects, it, it's fairly nice for a mentees because usually you're working on a very like small subset of the Linux kernel and you're not as exposed to uh, let's say feedback from from uh, some some other folks that might yeah, respond in certain manners to your patches. Uh, but looking back, um, would you like meaning uh, US mentees have rather enjoyed working on something that is like part of the production kernel, meaning not like some testing or simulator, but like some actual feature or uh, cleanups in the kernel? Or would did you actually enjoy working on that fine subset in a not controlled environment. That would be my question. I really like the idea of working on a self-contained project, especially, you know, there was something that I could I could just show and hey, this is mine or I started this and then people started, you know, working on this and using it. So it was very rewarding for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is this is really nice that you are limited just to one Thing because yeah, kernel is huge and before you know joining our outreach I wasn't even aware that there are many subsystems and they don't really talk to each other and um, so yeah so so I, I really like uh, I really like my uh, internship uh, and the way how it was organized very good yeah I mean I, I've been working for years on the kernel and I still think I've only seen a small subset so <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess no, you I, never get around that. <laughs> yeah. no, but I think the self-contained part is important for the internships because it's only three months. And like you guys have been talking about getting your patches reviewed, three months is not a long time. I don't get a lot of stuff up in three months. So and we want you to have a result that you can, that's meaningful. So we appreciate when mentors can Subdivide, subdivide and to find something in a small enough box that you can make progress. Yeah, I have to give a lot of credits to my mentors because they um, provided a lot of guidance or like project idea that was well formulated enough that I could really go and um, tackle it. I think it was already uh, really fleshed out and like very a lot easier for me to follow and um, get it to production or get it to final code. But also um, after that, uh, I think um, after that well-defined project, there was also an opportunity to work on like some newer like newer things that I haven't worked with, uh, like XDP in my case. I don't have it in my presentation, but I thought that was really interesting to like delve into different areas and learn more. And I, that hasn't been like formally submitted upstream or anything, but it was still a great opportunity to learn. So just the combination of that was great. Well, thank you everybody for joining in and you'll see this as you know, I'm sure you'll all participate virtually at least in the OSS summit on May 10th and onward and you'll see yourselves there. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Alison. Alison.